fiction, but science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. It's Mr. Dave Dollar Store Rama Martini. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. What's going on? for the name. Yeah. Well, it can't be karate. Well, I guess you're still doing karate. How much longer you got to do that for? Forever. I mean, forever. Forever. See, so my body forever. wears out. <laughs> well, that's not far. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you got a season left. <laughs> if I'm lucky. If you're lucky. Well, right. that's, I mean, hey, you know, I mean, it's your way of keeping in shape, keeping that. That's right. That Hemsworth body. That's right. <laughs> I'm working towards it. <laughs> Hemsworth when he's in the old age home. Yeah. Well, there was a Thor movie where he was fat, so, you know. Oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> fat Thor. Yeah. Fat Thor. Terrible. Yeah. It was a thing. Awful. It really happened. Well, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's just jump into it. We've got uh, right. we've got a, a writer here uh, from Kanakistan, and uh, <laughs> of course, uh, his book, his newest book, anyway, is called Boom Boom's Last Call. So that should be interesting. Right. So, Miss Mister Jeff Houlihan, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Really happy to have a chance to chat. Well. We'll see. <laughs> you know, I actually remember from some of your shows. That, that is the thing. Yeah, you asked, yeah we'll see at the end of the show. I'm pretty sure I'll have enjoyed it. Yeah, well, there's only been a few hang-ups in the years. <laughs> no, nothing major. So what's going on with you? How do you get into this um, this writing thing? Because this, this came along later in your life, right? Or you haven't been writing all your life. This is no. something you just, no. No, it didn't. Yeah, and really it was probably, it's now almost 14 or 15 years ago, but I'm guessing, like, even writers that start late in their lives, I think it's probably always was a thing. I was a reader. I had started a novel in my 20s and thrown it away, and I'd started another one in my 30s and thrown it away, and I was working at that point as a waiter and, and you know, getting a degree. But my creative outlet then was that I was playing in a punk band. I was playing in a band in Ottawa and, you know, writing songs, and, but then ended up, after my degree, getting a job uh, as a professor out here in eastern Canada, in St. John, New Brunswick. And at some point, I'd gone away on my first sabbatical and said, okay, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a book while I'm, while I'm on sabbatical. And got back from sabbatical and had written about 100 words. And at that point went, <laughs> and I think I was 50, I think I was 50 years old. And at that point went, I either take this seriously and actually start writing seriously, uh, or I give this up. That you're not gonna, you're not gonna write it. And that summer, I started getting up every Saturday morning and writing for four hours, and that was my thing. And I've been doing that essentially 52 weeks a year for the last 14 years. Get up every Saturday morning, write for four hours, and then in the evenings, uh, I'll find time to go back and and rewrite and edit. But those four hours are writing new words on a book, you know, once a week. And if you write, and I'm a pretty fast writer, so if I, you know, and if you write a couple thousand words a week at the end, you know, at the end of every year, you, you've got a book. Um, I, I, so you were in a punk band. Well, that that ought to be interesting. I'm, we're see. <laughs> yeah, and I was in the band for 13 years. There was a, there was a band called the Rain Kings in, in Ottawa, and, you know, we played around town, and, you know, we had, we did originals and all of that, and, you know, we had aspirations to, to you know, be good. We just weren't. <laughs> Right, right. What well, did you have like a mohawk or purple hair or something? No, you know, <laughs> no, you know, I, I, you know, I, I managed to figure out how to dress like a hipster. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have the mohawk. No, um, and at this point, you know, uh, mohawks aren't a choice for me. <laughs> you could buy a sticker on one. I mean, yes, I could, you know, I could. You know. But uh, and it was a great time to play in a band because you know we. We started, and I would say there was one of us that could play an instrument. The rest of us were learning, and, you know, it was that time in the early 80s when it was all do-it-yourself, and, you know, but 
you know, we played uh, together for 13 years, made CDs, made tapes, did all of that, and uh, yeah, it was great. And it was a total creative outlet. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Did you open up for the cult? No, but I can tell you, and I don't know how many people would remember this, but we did open for a band named, we opened for the Goo Goo Dolls. Oh, well, there you go. But it was a, yeah, you know, it wasn't a springboard to fame, I'll say no. that. No, no, you, you, you have to sleep with the band in order to get <laughs> <laughs> There are some lines I just won't cross. If you're a punker, there's no lines you won't cross. That, is, that, 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 that was the message, I guess, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it was funny because, you know, when we started, it was at a time when it was almost a bad thing to be good on your instrument, you know. We were, we were laughing at you know, people like Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin and the eight-minute guitar solos, because that was, and, and you know, I had looked back and go, you know, we actually thought it was a positive to not be good on your instrument, <laughs> which is a crazy <laughs> music. <laughs> like, we had a lot of fun, and, and, and I won't, I'll never act like it was a hobby. We were trying to, to do good things and writing music and, and writing songs, and, you know, we just weren't that good. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but that's how you get good. And you just got to hit yeah, it at the right yeah. time and keep working at it. And, you know, you just keep doing it. So now you've gone into this writing uh, life. Um, what kind of stories are you primarily trying to write? Like what, what what's your genre, yeah. I guess they call it? And, you know, it's funny because I do, you know, what I, what's been published. So Boom Boom's Last Call is the second book. Long Train Home was the first. I've got a three-book deal with Level Best, and the next will probably be crime fiction. But I, I wouldn't say I, I have – that's the genre I stay in. Now, at this point, I've got, you know, 13 or 14 or 15 manuscripts on the, on the hard drive, and, and they kind of cover the gamut from, you know, historical things to what I would think of as kind of contemporary fiction, and there's three or four or five that would fall into the crime genre. But – I mean, you have, I have the luxury of, you know, because it's not my day job, I have the luxury of being able to write whatever I want to write. And so it's whatever story hits me. And, and Boom Boom's Last Call in particular, like it was, a, it was a different approach than any of the other books. I'd actually writ, just written an opening line. The opening line to that book was something I'd written and had nothing else around it and then just decided, I, don't, I want to figure out who the person is that, that said that line, and and so that whole book ended up just ima being imagining who was the person who said the opening line to that book, and I would say none of my other books are like that, and you know they they, they come from different places and they end up being about very different things. So wh where do they come from for you? Like are you you you're talking about uh, or, or are they inspired from real events or are they inspired from something you've seen or someone you've known? Yeah, that's a great question. You know because I think probably. You know, a combination of things. And I could, you know, I could go to a lot of my books. That, you know, so I've, I've written a book called First American Hero that's, that's historical. It's about a guy who 12,000 years ago searching for his daughter that gets kidnapped. And that was just came from, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever driven across the Rockies from Vancouver to Lillooet. You're a Canadian. Have you ever done that drive over the Rockies? Yeah, several times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I think it's Brandywine Falls, is it, that there's a spot you can pull off there and there's, a, there's falls there. And standing there and just looking out over that lake and going, what would it have been like to be the first person? You know, you've come across, you've come across the Bering Strait, you're the, from, you're the first people to see this. What would that have been like? And so that was the impetus for that. Yeah, I would, I would, I would have been thinking about, would this be a good place to dump the body? <laughs> I, I guess, <laughs> yes, I guess if, I guess if, everything's crime, then, then that would be the thought, yeah. But, you know, so, and then, you know, I read a, a, another book was, you know, I read an article in New York Times about these two women blues singers from the 1920s that they'd they, they discovered a couple of recordings that, by them, but that's all they knew of them. And just this thought of having that kind of creative genius and at that time being black and a woman and having no outlet for it, what, what would that have been like? So... You know, it's different things, and, and the, the great thing is, whatever hooks me, I, I get to write about. Does it start with a character, or does it start with the actual story idea? So now I have to actually think about that for a second, because I think, I think probably with, you know, the one I was talking about, the two blues singers, it starts with those imagining those two characters and trying to figure out a line, a through line for that. But then there will be other things where, you know, like the historical one, where it is definitely... 
an idea for a story. So if I'm going to have someone here first, what's the dramatic impetus? What's driving it forward? And it's that he's looking for his young daughter that's been kidnapped, and he's going to have to walk across America to, to find her and bring her back. And so then it was the story. And so, yeah, I wouldn't say I have a, a you know, a, a, a process that's always the same from one to the next. And the project I'm working on now comes from, you know, what I see as a fundamental change coming in science, both with AI and with um, CRISPR-Cas9. I don't know if you're familiar with CRISPR-Cas9, but this is basic it's a technical, it's a technological thing where we're going to be able to go in and basically play with, you know, people's but also animals' DNA and just make them what we lo- what we want. And we're going to be able to construct people's genetics. So just playing with that idea. So that arose more from this idea of we've got this these scientific advances coming. What's it going to mean for what human beings are a thousand years not from now or two thousand years from now? So you know, that's more of a concept than either of those, a story or a character. So okay, so your characters then, um, wh- how how does that develop then? So if you're not starting it with a character like the two ladies that were singing the blues, so you don't have that in mind. So for instance, with Boom Boom's Last Call, uh, what you have Einstein Flint, uh, yeah, there, that's a name, and so that that character there, yeah, where did Einstein come from, and and how do, how do you interact with that character? Yeah, that's great because. You know, that really did come from that line was, I had the line written down, and, and it was then, who is this guy? Like, who is this guy that he says this, you know, fairly outrageous thing about his ex-girlfriend? Well, who is he? And then, is, then it is just building on that guy, and it is really this idea, okay, it's going to open with him being interrogated in an interrogation room in a police station about the death of his ex-girlfriend. And, you know, I suspect... I suspect you're familiar with this too, who haven't written is, you know, once you start to kind of inhabit a character, they grow. Uh, you know, it is, and, and there's no question that despite the fact that these stories come from different places, I do think, for me, all the best books, it's the characters that end up keeping me in the story. All of my favorite books, if the character's not right, I can't stay with it. So, whether there's a concept or a story that is good, if the character's not working, the book doesn't work for me as a reader. And so the same as a writer. I think I, I end up, I have to be invested in my characters. And and so definitely Einstein Flint was somebody that I was figuring him out as I'm going along. And even the name, the name came from my, you know, there was a, there was a, um, there was a Toronto Blue Jay player at one time his name was Darwin Bar- Barney, and I just love the idea of this famous scientist with this kind of Barney rubble, you know, this this kind of cartoon character name, that combination. And so I thought, oh, someday when, I, when I'm going to have a character that's not going to be Darwin Barney, but it's going to have that kind of odd name comedy. And then once you get it in your head that, okay, I know the kind of character he's going to be, and he's going to be bouncing, and he's going to be banged up from not only his life, but from having ridden rodeo, and he's kind of trying to figure out where he's headed. And then in that, like even, like uh, one of my favorite characters in Boom Boom's Last Call is his buddy, Thule, uh, Troy Fatula, who's uh, um, bipolar and, and struggling with that. And But they are absolutely best friends from kids. And, you know, as you're writing, you're going, Einstein needs someone. Who's that going to be? And, you know, I think you're a writer. You know, these characters can kind of appear for you. And you go, that works. That character's working. Well, Einstein Flint, he's a rodeo rider, but it seems like he was born in Brooklyn. How did that happen? Yeah, and that was totally just feeling like, okay, how am I going to make this an oddity? Because for starters, I mean, I'll occasionally tune into the rodeo. But one of the things, the reason I actually thought about him being a rodeo rider was, you know, what I when I think of rodeo riders, it is this idea that they're really athletic really strong, but often really compact guys, you know, not, they're not generally 6'4", 220, they're generally, to me, 5'10", 170, lean, strong, and so I had this in my, in my head, that, okay, that's the kind of guy he's going to be, and how do we make this unusual? Well, we make it, he's actually a New Yorker, he's, you know, he spent most of his life as a kid in the five boroughs, and, but then ended up west, and was tough, and brave, and learned how to do this, and... I don't fill in that backstory very much. Like, there's not much about rodeo. It's just that's who he is, and it's banged him up a little bit. And he got there kind of as an orphan who leaves New York, looking heading west, looking for something, and 
that's how that's where he ends up. Well, it's, it's kind of an interesting thought. So, yeah, how do you yourself make the character um, likable, in a sense that that um, even if they do good things, bad things, the whole the whole gamut of, of character. Yeah, I think that's the trick, right? Because you know, long term characters are people like Sherlock Holmes. There's people that certain characters can just take take a story and take it for a hundred years, and people still are buying and liking that character. So, what's your yeah. kind of concept? Yeah, you know, I guess you know when I think of Einstein Flint, for example, I go, look, he's he's flawed in in certainly in some ways, and but I guess. I'm always there's always two there's always two characteristics that I guess I you know in the characters that I love and you know that I uh, connect to it's courage and compassion and they're characteristics that I, I both of which I I wish personally I had more of and and I think I think this is I think this is an interesting thing to me always about writers is I think writers best characters are the are in some cases the people they would aspire to be, you know, the kind of person they would want to be. And so, and yeah, I, I look at Einstein Flint and go, he's ballsy, he's got guts, he's, he's, and, and he's loyal to his friends, and he, he, he stands for as long as he can stand, and, and he has his friends back, and but at the same time he cares about people, he's not indifferent. Um, but he can be quick to anger and quick to throw punches, and um, but there has to be this kind of streak of integrity that's kind of built from courage and compassion, and and so and, and I think those are often the the characters in books I read that I'm drawn to, where they're not perfect, they're flawed, and in some ways they're often, you know, old fashioned, you know, the men especially. Um, but it is those two things have they. Do they stand up when you need someone to stand up? And and have they got some compassion, some kindness in them? And I think almost anybody can relate to those kind of people. Well, obviously you haven't read my books, otherwise you see perfect. <laughs> it's interesting though, Alan, because you know my I, I had an I had an agent early on, Phil Spitzer, uh, and Phil Phil passed in the last couple of years, and and Phil was actually the agent for he was James Lee Burke's agent and. And Michael Connolly's agent and Ken Bruin's agent, and so I need to for some. And actually, it was the big, it was a huge thrill of my life when Phil responded to my my query because James Lee Burke at that point would have been my favorite writer in the world, and to imagine that that Phil Spitzer would represent me was just a huge thrill. But you know, after we tried, you know, we tried to sell Long Train Home and couldn't, but I sent him a, my second book, a book called Percocet Blues, and. And that character, he actually said, I, I, can't, I can't try and sell this book, Jeff, because this character, I, I just want to punch him in the face. Um, and so <laughs> I, I, I could read the email from, from Phil about, about that. And so, you know, all of my characters don't have this. Like, like that character in, in Percocet Blues, um, he's not a good guy. But even him, he's looking for redemption. Even at his lowest, he wants to be better than he is. And, and so I don't always manage to write the characters <laughs> that I admire as much. But I love that character because he was, he was just trying to be. He's what you want it to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. So what is your relation? Do you hear your characters? Do you hear them? Do you oh, talk to them? Like, oh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, and I don't know if, if you do this, but I've realized over the years that not everybody does this. But, you know, in I know in my own head, a lot of, when I'm in my head, it's often I'm having conversations with people. I'm having, you know, imaginary conversations. So I think I hear dialogue all the time. And so when I'm thinking about my characters and the next scene and where things are going, I am hearing dialogue in my head for sure. And you're, you're teaching people, children? <laughs> uh, well, I, children, I'm a prof. So I teach, you know, the youngest is probably 18. <laughs> That's still dangerous. And they don't get to hear. Anything. They don't get to hear all the conversations I'm having in my head. <laughs> no, but how do they know who's teaching? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a tough. It's a hard question. Yes, but first year students, they're less worried about what's going on in my head than what mark I'm giving them on their midterm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you're hearing these characters, do they end up surprising you? Do they take you know the plot off the rails a bit? and uh, make it difficult for you to, to, to go where you want to go, or uh, do you feel like you're more in control? I would say I don't think I've ever had that experience of feeling like the character's taking me someplace I don't want to go. I think I'm probably more in control than that, I guess. And I'm not sure, like, you know, I'm not sure that that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I think I, I, I suspect there's something to be said for 
how strong and real a character would be if they could actually take me somewhere else. Um, I think usually, but having said that, I, you know, when I start those uh, Saturday morning sessions, I usually have an idea what the opening that morning, where I'm starting, but it often goes places that I didn't anticipate when I started. But I wouldn't say that's really that the character necessarily has taken me somewhere unexpected. It's just that as things have moved along, I've seen a place where this could take an interesting turn or almost maybe, and I guess this would be something like what you're saying, or maybe the characters ended up in a spot where it has to go in a certain direction for them to keep moving forward. And so, yeah, I'm not a writer. You know, I hear about, what do they call it? Uh, they call it planners and pantsers or something. Um, you know, right. People that have everything mapped out. I'm not that. I often have what I would think of as six or eight or a dozen critical scenes that I think have to happen somewhere along the way. But then how I get from scene to scene is often, you know, a, not not planned at all. It's as I'm writing, there's places it goes. Writing an evil or dark character in the book, how do you um, get into the mindset of that? Yeah, yeah, that is harder, eh? Um, and sometimes I think, you know, it because, it, it, you know, in, in this book, probably, you know, the bad guys are Raoul Vargas, who's the cartel guy, and actually and actually Einstein's boss, Freddie Riley. Um, and, you know, I think of them as two different kinds of bad. Like, Freddie is just a character who is, you know, um, he's out for Freddie. He's self-interested, and that's what he does always. He acts in his own interests and, uh, you know, not getting pleasure in other people's, misery but willing to have people be miserable if it serves him um, and I guess I just see that you know we know people like that and and do I think I do a great job of capturing that it's hard to know right it's hard to know are you really getting inside a person like that's head and then to me it's even you know so that one I, I can actually understand better because I think we can all we've all at times in our life probably done things we regret out of self-interest and and so we can kind of understand how that happens. Someone like Ralph Vargas, who's just straight out and out a guy, you know, uh, he's a guy that's running a cartel and, and is ruthless. You know, I don't know if I capture that well as well because I don't know if I, I know what that kind of headspace would be as well. Oh, you're not dressing up and pretending to be the character and going out and doing <laughs> that thing. No, a little just an idea there, Alan. <laughs> Well, that's if you need, you know, you need ideas. That's what I'm here for. How do you, how do you, like, you've probably written about more kind of really evil people. Like, how, how do you find that headspace? Oh, I, it's, it's, I just dress up and act like them. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't really, for the most part, uh, it doesn't bother me. Um, I can get into it easily. But um, sometimes it does, depending on how real it is and how, how, if it's a real story that I'm working on, and if a lot of the people are still alive today, that tends to bother me more than um, taking historical characters and, and living through them. You know what I mean? Right. But but so when because it's also something I, I, I quite often I'll ask writers is because when you write over the last year or whatever time it was for you to write this book you're kind of living through your character, yeah. you know, day to day as you're writing it and you're putting them through things and you're experiencing and you kind of have to weigh it out like you're doing this to the person and this is happening and you kind of see see if it's realistic. And so you have to work through all of this. At, at the end of the year, quite often you've lived through your character that year. Yeah. And so I always ask if that, that in itself probably changes you as a writer but maybe even as a person, I, I don't know. I, I ask each person that. So how do you think writing about Einstein has affected or changed you? Yeah, and it's funny, having listened to your show, yeah, I have heard you ask that a couple of times. And I, you know, in some ways I'm going to be sheepish about answering it because I would say, I would say that it doesn't affect me very much at all. Um, I think... Uh, I inhabit these characters while I'm writing, but I think I step outside them pretty easily. And and you know, my given given the way I've written for the last 13, 14 years, which is you know really focused for four hours once a week, and then working on you know edits in the evening at times. 
you get some distance from your character, but you know I do spend that week in between kind of daydreaming about where it goes next when I can. But I've got a, a busy day job, so it's not something that you know I've had to partition that time out. And so you know uh, I I'm trying to think if any of the characters I've written over the years have left me you know kind of deeply affected by their kind of trip and. Well, it might not even be deeply, but, you know, just to think, okay, so you've got, it can be as simple as something like Einstein's a rodeo writer, an ex-rodeo, so you, in your mindset during this year, you're thinking about a guy who was a rodeo, and you even described how he's, you know, stocky, short, rough, tough, you know, so you have that in your mind. Just going through that and thinking about these things, it's like watching a movie, you watch a movie, it's going to affect you a little bit, you know? Absolutely. And look, there's no question. I would be surprised if any writer would answer this differently. I am entertained by my own writing. Like, there's no question about that. And I am at times moved by my own writing. You know, I, I have at times been in tears as I've been writing because I get a scene that just moves me. So certainly in moments, like when I'm writing, I do feel... Uh, you know, uh, in some sense it's transported. Like, you know, when my job's at its busiest, those four hours in the Saturday morning are really a bit of an oasis for me because I just live in that story for those four hours. And um, so, yeah, the stories, you know, I guess have an impact in that way, but I wouldn't say that I'd come away changed. Damaged. <laughs> come on, we'll say well, I think, I think, but what it does is that because now when you go to write your next book, everything you went through to write Boom Boom is going to change how you write the next book. Yes. And, and even in the process, there's some really interesting questions can arise, you know, because, you know, the book I wrote about the two, the two blues singers, you know, that's been an interesting process because I probably, it's an interesting story because I probably never had a more interesting querying process because this was at a time just after I had, left the Spitzer agency, um, so around 2020, and decided, okay, uh, you know, uh, his daughter was now running the agency, and, and I, I don't think I was particularly her cup of tea, and so I was querying that book, and I was querying several books at the same time, so I was using pseudonyms when I was querying, because literary agents are not that happy about getting multiple books from the same author. As I'm using those pseudonyms, I'm sending that book out under a pseudonym and getting, I've never got so much interest in a book than that book until they found out I was a middle-aged, old, white guy. Right. <laughs> And look, I think this is, I absolutely think this issue of cultural appropriation is a real concern and a serious thing, but it really forced me to think about that deeply in a way I hadn't, because when I wrote that book, it really, I know this sounds naive, but it's written from the perspective of two young black women in the 1930s, and it really didn't, I was so motivated to write that book, I felt such a, a link to this idea of what would it be like to have this creative genius and be unable to to actually share it with anybody. It just was such to me a strong, profound story that it hadn't really occurred to me very much that I was an old white guy writing in the voice of two young black women. And, and you know, literary agents, publishers all said, look, I'm sorry, we like the book, but we, we could not represent or sell this book written by an old white guy. And that really is one that's given me a lot of, given me a lot of thought, th things to think about, and ultimately, left me in a position where I feel like, look, I, I think agents and publishers and readers absolutely get to make decisions about who to represent, what kinds of books to publish, and what to read. But also, as someone, you know, we're, we're trying to be creative, we're trying to be artists, I get to choose what I write about. I can't, I, I can't take anybody's choice away from them about whether to represent, publish, or read. But I get to write the stories I want to write, and and I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. So there's no question my characters have forced me to think pretty deeply about some issues. Well, and that's a tough one because we're in a certain place in in history where it's a big concern for people. Like you know, you 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 a straight actor can't play a gay man, or a, you know, a white, a white man can't write about a black woman. Like there's all of that going on, and it's a really strong um, feeling in society, mm -hmm. right? And there's a real kind of battle over this thing. 
and and personally i think that it will resolve it will it will in time settle down um mm-hmm. and people will move beyond it i think it's just one of those situations because i've i've written some historical books about people that i'm nothing like but i think what happens is you can find out the history and find out the placing and write a very good story in that situation as if you were there right i mean it can be done but i think it's just in it's just the particular time right now so no and i actually i actually understand and have sympathy for it you know i feel like as a as a as a rock and roll fan i feel like look pat boone ripped off little <laughs> richard you know uh, there were definitely yeah. things that happened that were just wrong and you know, so i have a ton of sympathy for that position but i also have the sense that really art aside we want to imagine like if we're going to have a world where there's compassion and empathy we have to believe that men can imagine what women feel and that white people can imagine what black people feel and that straight people can imagine what gay people feel and that cis people can imagine what trans people feel we have to be able to to believe that we can imagine that and put ourselves in their shoes and and i think you know how that transfers to art and the and the business of writing to me is a whole different thing but i don't think we ever want to tell people don't try and imagine what people different than you are feeling yeah that's that's how you can get into what it would be like it's perspective right it's understanding the perspective from a different point of view it's not you know what I mean? It's, yes. It's, it, it, you can never be a black woman. That's not going to happen. No. But you can understand it, and you can get across strong points and emotions that... Absolutely. And, you know, the thing there, the thing that struck such a chord with me when I read that story was actually how starkly it was clear to me that I had been privileged. Because, you know, in my life, I've done a few different things. Like, so I played in a band. I, I've been a... Uh, kind of um, a sports analytics guy for a couple of NHL teams. I've been a scientist, and now I'm I'm writing. And there's never been a barrier, like except my own talent level. Like there's never been anybody that said you're not allowed to do this. And so when I read that, I felt like, what would it be like if anybody had ever told me you don't get to to actually do this thing? And I don't think. I have anything approaching genius level ability in any of the areas I've worked up. But I thought, imagine to be this kind of musical genius and not have an outlet. And it felt like something that was so close to me because I didn't have that experience. I, I, but I could imagine that, look, you've been able to do whatever you wanted to do, Jeff. And it's so enriched your life. And, you know, to, to, I felt like I could imagine that. Um, and it had nothing to do with being black or a woman. It just had to do with, you know, expressing yourself and having that opportunity or not having it. Well, when Dave strips, he imagines himself. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Well, as long as he's the yeah. only one. Yeah. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's the karate woman. Yeah. Um, oh, well, listen, so do you, do you put in a, a subtext? Do you have a meaning? Do you have some sort of point that you want to get the reader you know i come back to this where i go you know i you know and i you know even i i don't know why i keep flashing back to this because i listened to it recently you know what your interview with don winslow and you know him talking about entertainment versus you know i guess some kind of greater impact and you know i i i would be surprised that there are that many writers that actually only see their work as entertainment like i i guess i I aspire to something more than that, but if I try and put, if I try and put a, if I try and put a finger on it, it's not, it's not a moral message. Um, but you know, I think even back to you know, and I know, uh, you know, uh, reading as a youngster in my teen years, those writers who I read influenced who I was, and you know, I think writing can do that. I think it can actually. It can actually cause you to be to aspire to be something better than you are, to maybe look closely to see what are your weaknesses, and you know actually a little more self analysis. I I just think my reading has helped me to think more about the world, and I guess I would, I guess I would hope that even the stuff 
you know, because I think Boom Boom's Last Call is a straight noir genre book. Um, but it's a character that I admire, that I think he's got courage and thinks about other people. And I think, you know, I, as a kid reading, and, you know, I, I know this would be someone that gets dismissed. I read Louis L'Amour as a kid, and I will occasionally read Louis L'Amour Westerns now as a kind of literary comfort food. Right. Um, and, you know, those characters that were just, Strong, ethical, willing to sacrifice a lot for a principle. They may have been ideal, idealistic and unrealistic in some ways, but at the same time, I would say they actually gave me something to aspire to or something. And so, you know, I guess, I guess when I'm writing, I'm not thinking there's a message, but it never feels to me like all I want to do is just entertain someone for a few hours. Well, a lot of times it just happens organically when, when the character goes through things, they do things, they act in a certain way that means something, and that itself is kind of a, a, a subtext or a meaning that came out of just a story without you didn't sit there and write, sit down, I want to write a story where this person has to do this so that you, you know, it was just sort of organic within the character. So Yes, I think it almost has to do that because I think anything else – to me, draws readers out of the story. Like, any time I've read a book where it was clear to me there was a message I was supposed to take, it drew me out of the book. Of course. If it sounds like it's too set up yeah. um, and you have any sort of intelligence, you, you sort of lose it, right? I mean, it's kind of like, ugh, boring, right? Yeah. So, And now violence. Do you think about the violence you write? Do you think about how you write violence on a page? Yeah, you know. Um, and I guess I don't think of, you know, I keep referring back to this, this that I, I don't think I feel a, a real responsibility about that. I know, I know that in some interviews, authors talk about that they think carefully about, you know, that there's a responsibility to do, to, to describe the violence in a way that's, I don't know, um, I guess responsible, that there's a way that you can do it irresponsibly. And, um, you know, I guess I'm always just trying to write those violent scenes in a way that feels realistic without being exploitive. There's no point there where I'm thinking, I want to make this as gory as possible because I know there are people out there who get off on that. I'm never thinking that. I'm just thinking, just try and describe this in a way that your readers could see and, and, and would feel real. And I would say, you know, something I probably have in common, you know, who, like, you know there's writers I think you know, Cormac McCarthy's talked about the idea that, you know, when he writes, there's going to be a, there has to be a lot of stake. And what he really means, I think, is that, you know, I think he might have been explicit about this, that it's life and death. And that almost always means violence. And I would say most of my books have violence in them. Not all of them, but most of them. And I think it's probably because I get more invested in a book where I think the characters have a lot of stake. Well, speaking of violence, you know, and you said that um, Einstein is is quick to a punch, and how do you construct your 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 fight scenes? Do you act them out? Yeah. Well, you know, I think, yeah, I boxed for I boxed for a couple of years in my early twenties, so I think I have and and see, yes, and a lot of that, you know, I grew up in a kind of what I would say is a was a real, you know, I know they talk about things like toxic masculinity, and I think that exists, but I also think there's some really non-toxic mas masculinity out there. And I, I grew up in a house where, you know, the household was run, was run, I would say, by my mom. She handled the finances and all. And my dad was also a military guy, so he was, um, but, but a gentle guy. But from the time I was six or seven, he would be on his knees in the living room, and he would be working with me and my brother going, Here's how you fight. You, you know, you pop the left, pop the left, keep the right up by your chin. When you jab and you see an opening, you drop the right. And as a kid, you just grew up learning that and then boxed in later years. So I think I was not a guy that got in a bunch of fights, um, but uh, I was raised in a house where it was there are times when you should be willing to fight, that there are, whether you're defending a friend or defending a principal, there are times that you should be prepared to fight. And, and I knew how to. So I think when I'm doing a fight scene, I think I know something about fighting. And so that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about, you know, how do you throw a left hook? You know, right. how do you throw a right cross? Yeah. And I, I like writing those things. Yeah. From the memories of all your beating people up. <laughs> <laughs> well, even as a boxer, I was usually getting beat up, you know. 
I wouldn't say I was a particularly talented fighter, but I, I think I know. <laughs> Who do you know in real life that you've killed off in your books? <laughs> oh, let me think how many. Let me think if I've got people <laughs> in my in my life. Uh, I I don't have many characters. You know, it's funny. My in this care in the in the book where uh, the the you know the book from twelve thousand years ago where his daughter gets kidnapped. There's no question that the daughter in that vaguely resembles my own daughter, but she lives. I mean. <laughs> um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think I've ever killed off anybody I don't like. I'm not even sure in my real life I've ever wished that on anybody. We've got to have names and phone numbers here. We got, <laughs> you know, get some controversy here. Do some action. Look, it, the, the fun is being able to imagine this, you know. It just feels sad if it's in real life. Well, you know, I, I, I've just had, I've had people, writers say that, you know. A, you know, a woman cuts some guy off in a, in, in a lineup and, the writer writes her in as a character and kills her. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that idea. It may, it may show up down the road now, Alan. The idea that someone that just pisses me off, I can write them in as someone that I. And we're we're talking New York like. Times bestseller. You know, did that. So <laughs> I'm telling you, there's something about it. You know, I think it's capturing that that emotion of the anger of being cut off and being treated rudely. It's capturing that feeling that you have for those few minutes or whatever it, time it, it, you have that, and being able to write that on a page, that that's the, the key to it. You know what I mean? No, I, and I agree with what you just said big time, that I think when I'm writing at my best, I'm feeling the emotions of the moment in the story. Which, you know, so, so when I am in tears about something I'm writing that I think is moving, I'm pretty happy about that. It feels like I've found something there. And when... My pulse is up 20 or 30 beats because uh, I'm angry about something that's happening in the book. That feels like a good place to be in that moment, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it all, it all comes out in the wash, you know. Well, let's talk about how people find you besides um, being in bars and fights and boxing rings. Um, do you do social media much or do you do website? Like, um... Yeah, so we've got a website, jephulahan.com. I should have all my social media handles. I think my, my ex, uh, we call it Twitter, handle still now I think it's Jeff Wool. Um, so you know my my wife Kim is my publicist <laughs> and she's that's what she does for a living is is social media and marketing so you know I am on Instagram I think also as Jeff Wool. so you know um, well that's good you know we'll have all that on our website as well so people can find it and that but you know so if your wife comes to you and she wants you on TikTok be careful you know she's talked to me about that she's gone <laughs> my, my, my friend said a little piece of TikTok I go yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure I'm made for TikTok. Ah, uh, that's the beginning of the end. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's the beginning of the end. Do not. Whatever you do, she'll she'll put you in a weird outfit and you'll be dancing with the puppy dog on on TikTok. <laughs> and buy my book. You know my wife does because that sounds almost exactly plausible. Well, that's what I mean. So that's just remember this conversation because when when you say yes to TikTok, that that'll be where you'll be sitting on this chair. Holding this dog in a bee outfit, and you'll be going, "Why did I say yes?" And I do, I do not look good in a tutu. No, well, see, there you go. That makes it sell even more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, it's been good having you on the show. Um, now, the book, Boom Boom's Last Call, and of course, our guest is Jeff Houlihan. So, thank you for being here. It's been a real pleasure, Alan. I, I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Jeff. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.